Hallelujah. I'm glad you're here to weather the storm and the rains and, uh, and all that good thing. But it's good to be in the house of God this morning. Amen. Let's stand, shall we? Michael, is Michael here? Michael, are you ready to come? Heavenly Father, we just give thanks for this day, Lord God. We just come before you, Lord God, with this heavy rains pouring down. Lord, let your spirit pour down upon us this morning, Lord God, and water us and feed us, Lord, and nourish us with the fruit of the spirit, oh God. Hallelujah. May your presence just move amongst us this morning, Lord, and those who are making their way here, Lord God, we pray a hedge of protection around them, their vehicle, Lord God, and and Father, we just, I pray a special anointing and blessing upon those who are here today, oh God, and, and Lord, as we praise you and worship you for the mighty God that you are in our life, and we give thanks in all things in Yeshua's name, amen and amen.
Did you know it was going to be raining so hard you would have named it Swimming with the Lamb? <laughs> We're going to That's sing okay. Dance with the Lamb today. And take him by the hand and let him twirl you round and round. Follow his command and move your feet to the joyful sound. And soon he'll have you dancing. Like you never danced before We've got 
to keep on dancing And dancing as you go out through the door Then out in the street with everybody you meet You'll be dancing all the more Everybody be dancing Dancing with the lamb Dancing
let's just pray, shall we? Lord, we give thanks for this day that we could come and be in your presence, Lord, and for your word to come and come forth and bring change and get our minds thinking and our spirit awakened, oh God, to the days, times, and seasons in which we live. And Father, we just give thanks for the many blessings you've bestowed upon us, oh God. Well, Father, I pray, like I said earlier, Lord, I just desire a special blessing upon those here who are here this morning, Lord God, a double portion of your blessing upon them right now. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. Amen. This message is going to kind of almost be a parallel of what I shared last week. And I'm going to be sharing about spiritual victory. How many here would like spiritual victory in your life? Amen. Over time, society has moved towards a trend to where we are getting away from recognizing the value of God. We begin to separate ourselves, we begin to alienate ourselves, and we fail to see many times the importance of who God is in our life because, like the children learn today, we spend more time looking at the negative side of things, the garbage, than we do the positive things that God has given us in our life. Amen? Attitudes towards God have developed based upon one's situation and circumstances. So how we see God, a lot of times, is based upon how we see ourselves in the situations and predicaments we find ourselves in, whereby we begin to take God and mold him into an image, even create a theology that fits our particular set of circumstances for that particular moment. How many hear what I'm saying this morning? And eventually they set, we set standards for our life that can shift and change according to how our everyday life changes. We see it in the church, do we not? For example, I can have my own opinion about God towards what is right and what is wrong, but understand the viewpoint may change and my situation changes. And that's how I, I, you can see these kinds of things infiltrating the church with that kind of attitude. So in essence, we created God who is abstract. So what does it mean to be abstract? Well, it's when you look at something and you define it by what you see. But someone else can look at the very same thing and they can see something totally different from what you see. Like art, abstract art. You can look at this painting and then some of us would say, that's a painting. Or someone else could come in and say, wow, that's a wonderful painting. And then there's others who can even define what they see on the wall when you're sitting there thinking, I, I can't see anything there. Amen. <laughs> Abstract. And this is how the world, and in some places even the church, can have a view of God as an abstract God. But understand, God is not abstract. God is not an abstract God. God is a God who is an absolute. Amen. He's an absolute God. Our God is unchanging and he is uncompromising. And many times we in the church have a difficult time understanding because many times we are, if we don't like what we see or, or what we read in the word of God, well, then we turn to God's grace. God is not going to compromise his word because he's a God of grace as well. Amen. So in other words, you can't develop a theology about God based upon your personal situation and circumstances, nor can you base your bitterness and resentments towards God as far as creating him based on those things, nor base your opinion about who God is from your own beliefs that are personally adjusted to your own liking. He is not a God whom you can adjust and move our theology around in order to get public approval, right? And what I mean by this, you may... You may think of the church, well, the church is changing. They compromise to get public approval. They get, you know, people coming in because of the times and seasons. But God doesn't change his word based upon public approval to where we just want to be accepting of people. We want to accept people, but on God's terms, not our terms. Amen? And it goes the same even as an, on an individual level to where you have friends and people. How many times maybe you have found yourself backing off or being silent of what you believe because they may offend or they may not be in agreement with those whom you are around, who is influencing you, amen? God does not need the world's endorsement. Can I just say that? He does not need the world to see and approve of him because God is already relevant, all right? 
He is not looking for his people to become a seeker-sensitive church where people are more concerned about pleasing men than pleasing God. For it's this kind of attitude that brings about defeat in the Christian life because it's not based upon life as God sees it, but how man wants it. Difference. A life that lacks the foundation of God's truth. And without the foundation of truth, one wonders why they don't have victory in their own life. And in this kind of atmosphere where people run from God and their issues, instead of confronting them, that causes a problem. And in some instances, we can even at that point even abuse the grace of God. Now, there are times in our life when we experience those mountaintop experiences. How many have experienced those mountaintop experiences in your life? Amen. Where everything's, everything's just going great. Everything's going well. But then there are those valley experiences where things maybe aren't going so well. When times are tough and extremely difficult to where you can tend to find yourself maybe losing hope and finding yourself in that dry place, that desert place. And it's during these times when we can become scared. We become fearful and what is to come. And then we can even find ourselves getting desperate. And how many know that desperate people can do desperate things? And things, many times, they would never dream of doing. They can find themselves going down past. They never thought they would go down. And it's during these times when one can find themselves asking, is there hope? Can my life be restored? Or do I just lose face, accept defeat, and quit and give up? How many of us, have seen people who are going through a season of blessing. At the same time, there are people going through a season of testing and trial. And you ever ask yourself, how come me, Lord? How come I'm going through testing? How come I'm going through these things? And these people over here, no matter what they do, they seem to just walk in the grace. They walk in influence. They walk in your blessing, and, and, and I'm suffering here. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever stopped to think that those who are in seasons of blessing are there to confirm to those who are in seasons of testing <laughs> that you do come out of the test, amen, with victory, and you do come out of the test with blessing, amen? Yeah. Understand that the Lord knows the answer, and it is he and he alone who will restore and redeem and bring the blessing. The question is, when we read his word and we hear his voice, will we surrender ourselves to do his bidding without compromising his word? And allow the hand of God to move in our life without doubting. And know that he truly is our God. Amen? If so, then how many people here today truly, once again, want spiritual victory in your life? Amen? Hallelujah. Understand that in order to be victorious, it will require you to have victory in your own heart and in your own mind, first and foremost. In order to fight the battles, even those you do not even see yet. Those battles that are coming. Case in point, we're going to take a look today at the life of Joshua here, basically Jericho. But before spying out the promised land, Moses changes his name, right? It was Joshua and Caleb. But before he sends the 12 spies, Moses, into the promised land, one guy, he changes his name. And that's Hoshea. Hoshea meaning salvation or he saves. And what's he change it to? He changes it to Yehoshua meaning Yehovah is salvation. Yehovah, Yah, saves. Amen? And it's here where we begin to see God's hand moving in Joshua's life. And Joshua may not have even seen this whole thing coming down. Probably question, why did Moses change my name? And here he is, he changes his name that would then begin to define Israel's destiny along with Joshua's. The one who would lead them into the promised land. After wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years, Joshua has now taken over from Moses as the leader. As we read in Joshua 1.16, it says, And they answered Joshua, All that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only, say only, may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Now, for many of us, we have a tendency to view our challenges from a physical sense, physical point of view, which is usually determined by what we see in the natural. 
But notice that the people's response and concerns here are not just solely based on a physical sense. Be strong and be courageous. They have a spiritual sense as well. May the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Now Joshua sends two spies into the land to check things out, especially the land of Jericho. Notice he doesn't send 12 like Moses did. He sends two, probably praying and hoping and, and asking God, which two should I send? I want another Caleb and Joshua going into the land, not like the other 10, amen? And upon their return, Joshua prepares the people to cross the Jordan River, for he knows that the Lord has given them the land. He's given them this promised land. And Joshua gives specific instructions to the priests who with the Ark of the Covenant step into the Jordan River and as soon as the priest's feet touch the water, as soon as they get in the Ark, with the Ark of the Covenant, all of a sudden the waters from way upstream begin to rise up and curl up to where there's no more water running down the Jordan River, which its banks were then overflowing and stuff, no longer coming down the river. The river begins to dry up and the people canal can cross this mighty Jordan River on dry land. Joshua 4.19. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. Notice that the people's triumphant entry into their promised land. When did it occur? Nisan 10. Guess who else made a triumphant entry on Nisan 10? Yeshua. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> He's fulfilling the nation of Israel's promise, crossing the Jordan River, and he does it again in the New Testament with the people, with Yeshua entering into Jerusalem on a donkey, amen, on Nisan 10, four days before Passover, four days before he was going to be crucified. And it's amazing to see how the Old Testament is tied in with the fulfillment in the New Testament, amen? And what do they do then after that when they cross over? They have Passover, do you see the importance of these feast days? They have Passover, the first thing they do when they cross. So now this new generation, say new generation. A new generation of people here. All the times they had heard about the stories of the Red Sea and the parting of the Red Sea. Because remember, those 40 years, the older generation, they weren't allowed to enter the promised land. They died off. But now here's this new generation of people hearing the story. Now they see for themselves, granted not the Red Sea, but the Jordan now all of a sudden dries up and allows them to cross over. And they have now experienced the physical manifestation of God by crossing over on dry ground. And they have experienced now the spiritual manifestation whereby the Lord now demonstrates his approval of his man, Joshua. The calling on Joshua's life, just as he did with Moses. But understand this miraculous crossing of the Jordan River has also played a physical and a spiritual part beyond the people of Israel. For word gets out across the land, amen? And now the enemies in them, they're all hearing about this God of Israel who parted the Red Sea and allowed them to cross on dry land. Now here they are coming again, entering the entrance of, of the promised land, of the lands of Canaan and what have you. And, and all of a sudden, they become fearful, saying, oh, look, look what their God did. He, he parted the waters of the Jordan, so they could cross again on dry ground. And I'm sure the history and maybe even exaggerated stories of what they grew up with, the enemies heard, were now having them shaking in their shoes. Amen? Joshua 5.1, As soon as all the kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites, who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, listen, their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Again, upon hearing how the Lord would dry things up, the physical sense here of the land, of the waters parting, the land drying, they cross. These very people whom Joshua would now go to war against, their hearts, the spiritual aspect of their enemy, their hearts melted and their spirit was crushed. It was no longer within them. See how God can go before us in the presence of our enemies, amen? My friends, understand that in order for us to be victorious, it will require for us to have victory in our own heart first and foremost in order to fight those battles we do not see yet. Know also that the Lord has gone before us to prepare a way of victory. So here is Joshua observing the battle that lies before him. 
The city of Jericho is the first and foremost that he faces, whose walls are extremely large, extremely high. And inside of the, these walls is a well-armed and well-trained army, nothing going in and nothing coming out. In the physical sense, when they see it in the natural, this is a no-win situation for the people of Israel. And as great as the visceral problem is of, of Jericho and what it presents, it was not Joshua's real problem. So what was Joshua's real problem? It was the invisible war that he had to fight first and foremost within his heart and mind that was the real challenge. It was first learning how to overcome the challenge of past failures. I'm sure what was running through his mind was how Israel refused to listen to him and Caleb when they first came upon the promised land. And how would the people now follow him into a battle that when you look upon these things, looks hopeless, looks like a no-win situation. If they feared the giants, what are they going to do here and when they come to Jericho? See, it's easy for us to look from the outside in, but we do not have the same struggle. Do we not have the same struggles today? Amen? Yeah. Where we begin to see giants in our life, where we begin to see the high walls and all these things are going on around us and wonder, how can I have the victory in this situation in my life? Listen, it's not easy, but our past failures need to be given over to God so that we can move ahead into victory that he has already, say already, already, prepared for us. In Philippians 3, Paul shares with us how to deal with our past failures. First, we are to realize that no one escapes failure of any kind, right? Has anybody here never had a sense, anything that you failed in in your life, you got it all right 100% of the time? Anyone here? We all fail. We all make mistakes, right? None of us have a time in our life where everything was just always perfect for our entire life. And yet, we read in Philippians 3.12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Paul right here is laying it all out. I'm not perfect. Neither are you perfect. But I press on to make it my own. Why? Because Christ Jesus, because Yeshua has made me his own. Just as we've been singing this morning, amen? Then we are to leave the past where it belongs. And where does our past belong? In the past. Philippians 3.13. But one thing I do, forgetting what, what? Lies behind. Leave it back there. There is nothing more you can do to change the past. But you can make changes in the present day and in the future. And then we are to focus on those things which you can do something about. Philippians 3.13, he goes on to say, and straining forward to what lies ahead. Notice he uses the word straining, that it's not going to be maybe such an easy path pressing on and moving forward. There may be persecutions. There may be those valley experiences. Amen? So not only did Joshua have to overcome the challenges of past failures, but he also had to overcome his own preconceived ideas of how the battle should even be fought. I can only imagine the countless hours Joshua spent designing his own plan along with his commanders of his army on how were we going to defeat Jericho, only to learn how to put aside his preconceived ideas and learn how to do it his way. I can't tell you how many times even in my own life where I've approached issues with my own preconceived ideas and God reminding me that, you know, his ways are his ways, my ways are my ways, but his ways are, are best. And he changes things to where my plans aren't going to work. And then he wants to see how am I going to react. And if I would respond in being obedient to the plan that he has for me moving forward. Anybody been in that place? Come on. A couple of us have had our lives changed. Amen. Thank God. The rest of you, boy, you must be really walking in the blessing. Amen. Hey, hallelujah. God is good. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. God often needs to remind us also of Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts 
than your thoughts. Now, for some who are the controlling spirit, those who like to micromanage, doing it God's way can at times be extremely difficult. But I'm sure we have nobody here with that kind of spirit controlling or anything here. Amen. Now, along with past failures and preconceived ideas, Joshua also had to learn to put aside his own personal attitudes. And I'm sure we have nobody here with any attitudes, right? I'm sure wandering around in that wilderness for 40 years, I'm sure Joshua, over time, began to develop some attitude. And I'm sure there was more than once on one occasion in 40 years where he began to say, man, if these people had only listened to Caleb and I, we wouldn't be wasting our time walking around in this desert. We'd be in the land of milk and honey. We'd be in the promised land. We'd be victorious. We'd be taking things over. I, I, I imagine that's the kind of guy he was. And that's why God chose him to be there, to, to, to be mentored by Moses. And so I'm sure he began to cop some attitude. But how many times have we copped a bad attitude simply because we thought we were right and they were wrong? Listen, even if you do everything right, which you don't, and you won't, people around you will still doubt and complain. Great message we had today, right along with this. No matter if you do everything right, and no matter how right you are, there will still be people who will complain and will doubt and find fault. The secret is to not allow other people's bad attitudes to disturb your peace and cause yourself to develop a bad attitude. That was a lesson I had to learn, and I'm glad I learned it young in life because I would, it would go down a nasty road. You know who the people were that were the biggest pains in the neck in my life and caused me the most grief? Christians, the church at a young age because I couldn't understand their pettiness because I couldn't find the pettiness that they were making issues of even in the word of God. See, we, again, allow our, our, our ways of doing things because we, this is the way we want to do it, not the way God wants to do it. And how many lives can be ruined and destroyed by that? Amen. Now, learning that secret is not an easy thing to do as well, but it's a must. Now, this doesn't mean that we hide our heads in the sand either and deny the reality of the problems we face. But simply submit our attitudes to God and trust him with the challenges that lie ahead in our life. Again, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4 gives us reminders when it comes to our attitude. First, when we are going through our problems, we are to rejoice and praise God in the midst of our problems. Amen? And I'm sure everyone here, every one of us, when we are going through struggles and problems, the first thing we do is we just begin to praise God in the midst of our issues and our problems. Silent in here. You're supposed to be yelling, hey man, yeah, yeah, that's what we do. Now, this doesn't mean that you are to enjoy your problems. That's not what I'm saying. But just praise God in the midst of them. Why? So our attitude doesn't turn sour. So our attitude doesn't get bitter and full of resentments and anger. Amen? And then in the midst of our praise, we are to pray and tell God everything that is on our heart. Share with him during that time of praise what you're going through, the struggles you're going through. Isn't that what relationship with God is really all about? Instead of going to your friends and complaining and getting bad advice, how about praying and listening for God to give you the good advice? Right? The right place to go, the right things to do. And when we do, God's peace will rule our heart and our mind. And instead of looking at all the negative things we're going to be going through, we will begin to meditate and see all the good things that God has done for us. Be the bee. <laughs> Amen. Be the bee. Yeah. Philippians 4, 4 through 8 says, Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Only in your mountaintop valleys, only when things are going well. Amen. No. Rejoice in the Lord always. Say always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle, say gentle, your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near, and I believe the Lord is near. Amen. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Yeshua, in Christ Jesus. Amen? Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, turn on Fox News. Watch MSNBC. CNN, you know, see what's going on. No, dwell on those good things. Dwell on the positive things. Focus on the things of God and what he has done in your life. Like Joshua, we all face difficulties in our life, but we must first conquer the daily war within our own heart and within our own mind by winning the war over our past, by winning the war over our preconceived ideas, by winning the war over our attitudes. When we do this, we will then really begin to understand and know how to fight the battles that come before us. So how do we win the battle? How do we overcome? How do we have the victory even before the battle starts? First, the battle is won by remembering who is in charge. And I got news for you. It's not you or I. Amen. Joshua 5.13 when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. And it's believed that this man who appeared, the commander of the armies was who? Who do you think? Yeshua. And so here we have Joshua going out to survey the landscape with the intentions of devising a battle plan. And when suddenly he has this encounter with the commander of God's army, Notice that when Joshua comes face to face with this man standing before him, sword drawn, he asks, are you for us or for our adversaries? Are you for us or against us? Are you friend or are you foe? And his response is simply, no. No? You either are or you're not. What do you mean, no? A response that I'm sure was extremely puzzling to Joshua. Because only God could make an answer like that. It's probably why he fell on his face and began to worship. Amen? And praise him. What is it you want from me? But the commander of the army didn't identify any side. Why is that? Why do you think he responded that way? With just no. Because when God walks on the scene, he does not come to take sides. See, when he comes, he comes to take over. Amen? He's God. He's in charge. He's the commander of all things. Amen? For it's not about asking God if he's on our side, but whether or not we're on God's side. Amen? And this is an important factor when we face the many battles in our life, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So one needs to ask themselves, who's in charge, me or God? Now notice what the Lord says to Joshua in Joshua 6.1. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. He already said, you already won the battle. Now, how many of us would say, Oh, I already won. Well, then I don't have to do anything. Right? Go ahead, God. Let me know when it's all done. Amen. How many people in the church have that attitude? God said we got the win. We already won. Hey, I'm just waiting for the sweet by and by to get taken up into the sky. Amen? <laughs> to where we don't have to do anything. Before the battle is even fought, the Lord has already proclaimed it's happened. For as long as we are on the Lord's side, the battle is won. But remember, again, who's in charge? But we also need to remember that God's thoughts don't always line up with our thoughts. His ways don't always line up with our ways, meaning his method of doing things may differ from our methods of doing things, but God's method of doing things is the right way, right? 
After telling Joshua the battle is already won, the Lord begins to give him his plan for victory. And know that just because the Lord gives us the victory again doesn't mean that we don't have a part to play in it. Let's read Joshua 6, 3 through 9. And here's the battle plan. And I'm sure many of us would have come up with this same plan. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once, thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before them. Wow. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the Ark while the trumpets blew continually. Now, I can only imagine what Israel's military commanders were thinking when Joshua said, okay, there's the battle plan. And they're like, well, all right, let me get this straight. You want our military to march around the wall of Jericho with the priest blowing the shofar one time for six days in a row. Yeah, yeah. And then, then on the seventh day, now correct me if I'm wrong, march around the wall seven times with the priest blowing the shofar carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and then when the priests make a long shofar blast, you give the command and all the people shout aloud. That's it. That's it. That's it. Are we missing something? Joshua 6.10. But Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth. Listen to that. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout, then you shall shout. So here's Joshua instructing the people to be quiet until they are told to speak. Sometimes the best way to hear God is just be quiet. And he's instructing them not a single utterance, not a single word. We have times of silence here, and it's never silent. Because then you got people speaking in tongues, praying. You know, they just, people have a hard time just sitting in silence. I, I did this once. Remember, we did it once before worship. For five minutes, we had silence. And you could sense the uneasiness, like, when are they going to do something? When are we going to do something? You know, what are we, you know. Sometimes the best way is to just be quiet. Yet, as easy as it may sound, this can be difficult for some people. What? You, you want me to be quiet? Me, not to utter and speak a word? And the men said, yes, yes, that's what we, we want. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I can't help but think how many people would respond if I gave such an order or a command. People are only to be quiet, only be silent, and not allowed to utter a single word out of your mouth until I say God says we are to speak or sing or worship. Or shout. And remember when Joshua gave the people God's instructions? Listen, he never told them that the walls were going to come down. Read the scriptures. He doesn't tell. He knows what God says, but he doesn't share that part with them. And God told Joshua that they would, but Joshua never told the people that the walls were going to come down. And that's how obedient they were to them. Of course, as we read earlier, if they went against them, what, what did they face? Death. In all honesty, how many would agree that there would be murmuring, complaining, and gossip like there was no tomorrow in today's society? If I did that in the church today, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, instant messages, my phone be ringing off the hook, all these things would be going on like crazy because people would be sitting there going, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, right? Yeah, what does God tell us? Well, he tells us in Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be what? 
silent. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us and the God of Jacob is our fortress. Psalm 62.1, for God alone, my soul waits in what? Silence. Silence. From him comes my salvation. He only, say only, only, is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. It amazes me how the people obeyed Joshua's commandments, even though they didn't even have all the facts or all the details. I've experienced it in ministry myself when you share with people some things. Well, I, need, you know, I can't share with you all the details. I can't tell you what's going on. Please, just do what I ask. And that's difficult for people today. Today, how many people would have just given up and quit? Like I said, because this plan is, is disaster. I'm not walking into disaster. I'm not walking into a defeat like this. And yet, how many people don't see the answers to their own prayers because of that same attitude? Simply because they've maybe stopped just short of their victory. All because they've given up and quit. Could have been that close. And all of a sudden, an attitude kicks into gear. Even when they were doing it God's way, maybe they lost faith and grew impatient and eventually gave up. Victory can be ours if we don't quit and if we don't give up. Joshua 6, 16, 6. Joshua 6, 16. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Can we have a shout? Yeah. Amen. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. So what was it that made the walls come down? It was faith. It was trust in God and obedience to God. Hebrews 11.30 by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. He tells us right there. By faith, the walls of Jericho came down. When you didn't even know the full entire plan, when everything wasn't all laid out in front of you, it was your faith and the faith of the people that make the walls come down. It's your faith that makes the walls that you set up around your life that doesn't allow the good things of God to come in where they will come tumbling down. Amen? Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with what? all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. And he will make your straight, uh, your straight, your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Amen? Deuteronomy 28, 2. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Amen? Faith trust and obedience. Now, when God blesses us, in whose name then will we declare the victory in? His name or your name? You want to see a blessing dissipate real quick and real fast? Start taking credit for it. Amen? For God is the one who should be given the glory and all our blessings in him and his name alone. For in him we are overcomers. Say overcomers. We are the head and not the tail. And for him in him, we are victorious. Amen. Can the worship team come forward, please? Quickly. Now, let me just share this one little thing with you. Do you realize that each and every one of us, we had the victory and were victorious before we were even conceived? We were given the victory. We began to have victory before we were even conceived. Think about it. You were this little, tiny, little sperm amongst 300 million other little sperms. And then making its way into the tube, heading towards the egg, about 100 million make it into the tube. And then... You were the one who got to the egg first and fertilized that egg. And you won the race. Amen? <laughs> you were victorious and you became you. You won. 
Look to your neighbor and say, I won. I won. <laughs> I won. I was victorious. Tell him I'm victorious. I'm victorious. Hey, come on. Come on. You got to see it. Your life was planned by God. He knew you before you were even conceived. He knew you were already a winner and already victorious. As ridiculous as you may think it sounds, it's the truth. Amen. There were 300 million others that didn't make it. But you were chosen. You were chosen. You were made to win and to have victory since the beginning. And that's an awesome thing. When we begin to look at the purpose and calling upon our life by Almighty God, we are here for a reason and for a purpose. And I don't even like to swim. And I won. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand, shall we? I want to just take this moment for us to declare our faith and believe in God. And can we just praise him in all things? And I want to say this. If you need to come to the altar as we begin to sing, as we begin to praise God, whatever it is that you're going through, whatever you're struggling with, whatever things you want victory over in your life, whatever maybe things you're beginning to maybe foresee happening and you want to stop it before it happens, Come to the altar. Come and lay it before the Lord. Lay it before the cross. Amen. And don't, like I said last week, don't take this burden upon yourself. You'll lose. You got to give it to him. Amen. Amen.